Hi, I'm Dietrich Stout. I'm the Associate Director of the Center for Mind, Brain, and Culture. And uh, this is Inside the Lab with the CNBC. And uh, today our guest is uh, Dr. John Lindo, who is an Assistant Professor in the Department of Anthropology at Emory University and an expert in uh, ancient DNA and population genetics. How are you doing, John? Good, good. How are you? Thanks for having oh, me. Not today. bad. Uh, but maybe you could uh, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. So a little bit about how my research got started. It actually got started with um, working with uh, Native American populations and, and genomics. So I was actually working with modern DNA, um, but um, several tribes came to the lab that I was working with while I was doing my PhD to examine some of their ancestors that had been unearthed in areas um, from their, their own territories. And that's actually how I became interested in ancient DNA and actually started with attempting to link ancient um, ancient civilizations with modern populations such as Native Americans or or their rather their ancestors and how they that might help with their territory claims but also also help them potentially understand some of their deeper evolutionary history and connection to lands that stem thousands of years. Cool. So. Uh... You mentioned both modern DNA and ancient DNA, and uh, there's a lot of challenges working with ancient DNA, obviously. How do you see those two things working together, or uh, are there benefits to each of them? Well, they, uh, yeah, they're, they're two very separate things, because when you're dealing, well, I mean, they're, they're interconnected if you get to deal with the, the population that is connected somehow, or thinks that they might have some sort of ancestral connection. But they're, they're two very different things, meaning that when you're dealing with people, these are living individuals, and there's a lot of community engagement and ethics that you have to um, really make sure that you're doing in order to do these types of studies correctly from an ethical perspective. But then when you're dealing with ancient DNA, then that sort of adds even more problems if you don't have the modern population connected because you don't really know who the ancestors are and you're trying to figure out who they are and see if you can actually reach out to them if, if there are any even existing because actually a lot of populations on this planet like those in Europe have actually been completely replaced if you can start going back 30,000 years or, or so. So two very different things but sometimes I get the opportunity to link the two by working with the community and presumably their ancestors and that's what I, I aim to do with my work in the Americas. Okay, so yeah, so that's uh, something you're working on now. I mean, what, what, what kind of stuff you got going on in the lab? Uh, so right now we have one one um, pro one big project that's actually completely modern, and we're dealing with uh, almost ten tribes from the United States and um, Canada. There, they're referred to as First Nations and not Native American tribes. And the whole point of that is actually to do these deep coverage whole genomes from these uh, tribes from all over North America and actually start to look at what the genetic ancestry of Native Americans looks like because we actually don't know. Um, I think you may hear that someone took a 23andMe test and all of a sudden they, they're saying they're 5% um, Navajo or something like that and that's actually completely inaccurate. We don't have reference panels for any Native American tribe and certainly not ones that have been uh, publicly available. Um, so we actually don't know what um, the actual ancestry of Native Americans looks like um, from a whole genome perspective. And that's really the only way that you should be doing it at this point, because that's the, the technology is available and that gives you the whole picture and it allows you to go back, you know, 20,000 years when the first peoples came into the Americas. And so it's a really exciting project because it's going to give us ideas about the demo first demographies, of course, reference panels as to understand Native American ancestry, and also start disentangling this idea that Native Americans are a race, right? They came in 20,000 years ago, but they all formed for many thousands of years. They split up and they spent farming their own populations with their own evolutionary and population and cultural histories that should be acknowledged and not grouped together as, you know, this single arbitrary, you know, quote unquote race, which obviously is a is not a biological reality, but just a, a social construct. So that's the modern thing. You want to hear about the ancient stuff? Too? Uh, so, 
<laughs> well, let's uh, follow up on, on that a little bit with the, the, the modern DNA. I mean, so uh, um, you, you've, you've said, which is a little bit surprising, that it's virtually unknown territory, you know, these genetic profiles of uh, different Native American groups. Uh, um, but surely I know that there has been lots of uh, uh, speculation about population histories in the Americas. And uh, are there any particular big outstanding questions that you're hoping to contribute to that project? Uh, so I think I think the big outstanding questions for me are regional. We don't understand any of the really the regional history. So I, I could take it all together and start asking uh, continental questions as to modeling as to when Native Americans first came into the Americas and stuff like that. But I'm actually much more interested in the regional questions and the regional evolutionary histories. When um, when North and South America split up, when did Mesoamerica and say uh, tribes that currently exist in Canada, when did they split? And also I'm really interested in potentially detecting natural selection for all these different environments that certainly the first peoples of the Americas must have dealt with in terms of adapting potentially to you know, UV radiation, certainly when agriculture came up or different diets like marine-based diets and things like that. Right, and so uh, you think you can get those adaptation questions from the modern DNA or are you gonna need to turn to ancient DNA for any of that? Right, it's a little bit more difficult to do it with modern DNA, um, mainly because you start losing the signal, um, especially if these, these events happened many thousands of years ago. Um, so we could, we can hope to find them, but um, you're right, these signals start to break down with modern DNA. So it's not as good as when you have ancient DNA and it's pretty close to the adaptation event where these signals are gonna be re very strong for natural selection. But we can try and also whole genomes give us much more power to do it as opposed to just looking at like 1% of the genome, which is usually with the type of data that, that's been looked at previously. And is that because of a computational uh, limitation or a sampling limitation or? Yeah, I think it's more cost. I think now the cost has really gone down. The technology has increased, so it makes it uh, more efficient to get whole genomes and the cost has gone down. Now we can get, or modern, we can get genomes, whole genomes at almost $500. So that's a huge difference in say 10 years ago where it was like many thousands of dollars for a, for a whole genome. Right. Yeah, you guys' work is very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it is. Ninety percent of the money for my grants goes into just DNA sequencing, which which is unfortunate because it means that I, that less less for personnel and postdocs, which to do the work. <laughs> right. Yes. Uh, so, so you uh, you mentioned um, you know that uh, uh, modern DNA is a little bit limited, and ancient DNA uh, can help with that. So, the great thing is you also do have access right. to ancient DNA, and you're doing work with that. So, um, can you tell us a little bit about ancient DNA projects you've got going on? Yeah. So, right now, those are um, focused in Meso and South America, and those are in conjunction with modern living peoples that are in the in the in the area, but. Um, South America is very complex in terms of um, associating ancestry with ancient individuals because they're not as well organized in terms of what we have in Canada and North America in terms of um, tribal rights or the indigenous community rights obviously is going to change from country to country. So it's, it's a little difficult to associate the two, but I hope to, uh, I've established connections with communities in the regions from which um, the ancient samples have been unearthed and they've been I'm hoping to find all different types of questions um, the, one of them is of course high altitude adaptation but not in Peru because Peru's sort of been overdone um, Ecuador actually has uh, high altitude adaptation and uh, was one of the capitals of the Inca Empire and that hasn't been looked at and it's also interesting to see how those populations relate to ancient Peru in terms of trade and um, you know, um, admixture between the two. But I'm also interested in looking at signals, um, ancient signals in Brazil from populations or a migration that may have um, originated not from Siberia, but they seem to be originating from Oceania, which is interesting. And that's sort of a big uh, question that keeps coming up, but no one's been able to solve it. So um, ancient Brazil samples are sort of a really exciting, 
uh, area. And then there are others that are simply, we have no data whatsoever. There are ancient populations from Uruguay, which are really interesting because unfortunately, um, all of the indigenous populations in Uruguay were completely wiped out. There are none. So we, have, we don't know who they were. So that's a, a big question for me. And then other places like Colombia, we don't have any information about any of those ancient civilizations. Argentina, who it's actually also quasi high altitude. Um, and then of course, some of the great civilizations like the Maya and the Olmecs we have samples from. And those are some really fascinating uh, questions that we could arise in terms of who these people were demographically and also um, from an adaptation perspective. Wow. Sounds like you got your work cut out for you. <laughs> there are a lot, of, a lot of basic science that, that needs to be done there, huh? Yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, lots of data is being generated in the lab right now with my postdoc, who's, who only has a month left before she uh, okay. well, leaves. <laughs> <Hurry up. laughs> yeah. um, I, I have to ask, you mentioned the, uh, the, the uh, puzzling Oceania connection uh, with, with Brazil, and I was just reading uh, something in the news yesterday. You were quoted, uh, it was a... Uh, a story about uh, uh, South Americans in Polynesia 800 years ago. Uh, yeah. It, you know, do, do we have any idea what's going on? <laughs> the Polynesia? Yeah. With Polynesia? Yeah, I think that that paper was really interesting. The only problem is that they made a connection with Colombian populations that are modern, and those populations are, are heavily admixed with um, many different ancestries, not just indigenous ancestry from South, South America, um, so that, that could add complexity because what they did was they tried to uh, basically carve out the indigenous ancestry and then made the link of that indigenous ancestry to Polynesian populations. But that's, they, they're a very sophisticated lab and I'm sure they did the best that they could. But at the same time, I don't think it's going to be uh, as foolproof as if you had gotten ancient DNA before European contact um, where it's just 100% indigenous populations and, and gotten that signal of Polynesian ancestry that way. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a, a I, I believe it, uh, but again, there's some, you know, some, some caveats with that, but I think it's really interesting. And actually my lab is going to start looking at Colombian samples. So that's one of the things that I pre-contact, pre-European contact. And that's something that I definitely want to um, test to see if there's a Polynesian connection like detected in that paper. Yeah. Yeah, as you said, I mean, it certainly seems very plausible, but there's a big difference between, right, thinking that it happened, being able to, to show it for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I also don't think, I also think it's not that far of a stretch to think that Polynesia is made to South America because they were able to populate this immense space in the Pacific because they had these incredible, you know, navigation skills. Going to South America didn't seem like, uh, to me, that far, far enough. Uh, of an idea. Now, I do th think that the paper also proposes that South Americans may have gone to Polynesia, but yeah, I mean, you're you're an archaeologist. Do you know? If, I mean, we don't really have any information about their sailing technology. So. No, 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 we don't. So, so that's that's just speculation. Uh, you know, there's um, and what we do with that is generally plausibility arguments. You know, and that's been done all the way back to Contiki, right? Where you know. He's, it's, it's plausible, um, but we don't know uh, for sure that they had that technology. Uh, so yeah, need to, need to find a boat. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, it's pretty, pretty challenging, but uh, well, I mean, and that's when people also can turn to the genetics uh, and, you know, and hopefully you guys will, will help us out. Uh, but uh, um, so I know I always I know it's still on your website, and I always ask you about it. the The whole uh, dog project is that uh, clicking along, or uh... right? So yeah, actually, that um, that's on the roster to start testing the the. So I have. Okay, sorry, if you, I, I should, could you explain what the dog project is? I have these uh, five thousand year old samples um, from Europe. And it's, it's strange because usually you find dogs, uh, individual dogs, but in this particular site, there was a population of dogs. It seems that they, potentially, that they may have been burying these dogs. Um, so I have uh, a population of these dogs and hopefully they will yield enough DNA so that I can do population genetics on them. Because usually you only have one individual to do these studies, but with population genetics, I mean, with a population, I could do natural selection scans. Um, 
So that's really interesting because I'd like to use them as a baseline to try to figure out uh, some of the modern dog breed behaviors that seem to be innate genetically or presumably they have a genetic background. So I'd like to use these 5,000 year old dogs to um, tease out when these behaviors were selected for and see if I can identify the, the genes or the area of the genome that might be, say, you know, dealing with uh, aggression in German shepherds or sociability in uh, golden retrievers and things like that. Uh, but that is, that is going to be in the testing phase. And then of course I have to get a grant for that. So I haven't, I haven't even thought about that yet, <laughs> but that is one of my, that's probably going to turn into my favorite uh, project. It sounds really cool. I, from what I understand, people love dogs, so I hope the uh, the, the the grant <laughs> come through. But I, I and I'm, I haven't followed the whole dog domestication uh, uh, literature, but I thought at some point there was a you know multiple origins type uh, uh, scenario considered, and, and I was just wondering, five thousand is a fantastic sample, but then it's just one population. So mm -hmm. uh, is that an issue? Right, so it's a, every paper seems to change the theory as to what happened. Like, I think that's a way right, um, a lot of papers are, it depends on where the lab is based, then they'll claim that that's where domestication first arose. So if it's Europe, then it's Europe, it's China, it's China. Um, but then there's one ancient DNA paper that used one dog that was 4,000 years old from Ireland, and they they concluded that there were two different domestication events, one in Asia and one in Europe. And then potentially that uh, with migration, the Asian dog populations took over the European lineages. Uh, but that, who knows if that's true? Uh, that's only very limited uh, samples and only one ancient dog. So uh, I, I reckon that it's going to change dramatically as soon as we get more and more samples in terms of what these domestication theories look like. Yeah, I guess that's usually, usually what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Multiple domestication doesn't seem that outlandish. You know, you always read about uh, sort of how suitable dogs are to uh, domestication and, you know, that kind of thing. But, of course, again, it's the case of it seems plausible, but we don't know. So, so are those, does that cover the major projects that you've got going on? Is there anything else you're working on? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So, and the dog is really a future project. Right. So I have to ask with this work in uh, South America, especially, but I guess all of your work, uh, um, is this affected by uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic? Uh, do you like, already have the samples? or? Are yeah, you... yeah, that's a, luckily I had sent, I had gathered all the samples um, two years prior. So luckily everything was in the lab, but what ended up happening is my lab got shut down. And which makes it even worse for me because it had only officially been open for six weeks before COVID shut it down. <laughs> so, um, and then I, well, my postdoc got back into the lab in June. Um, so she's been working um, as hard as she could, uh, as hard as she can in order to get as many samples out before she actually leaves the lab. Wow. Yeah, it's been, it hasn't been good, but it's, I don't think it's been good for for anybody with a lab, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you know, I mean, the, the the great thing that you know is you have the you have the samples, you know. So that's a that's a that's a huge thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, well, you say anybody with a lab. I've got a lab, you know, in which I have a table with bits of broken rock spread out on it. You've got like an ancient DNA lab, and as you mentioned, it took you how that took you a couple of years to get that set up. What's it like trying to set up a lab like that? Yeah, I think it's more um, the problems just came into cost. Uh, I, I'm not sure why these costs balloon like that. I guess it's just construction in general, but it was just, yeah, it was delayed for two years. So that's not, not good for me, but at least I was able to get the samples and then grant funding while I waited to actually start the heavy duty sequencing. All right. And what, what do you have to have for a lab like that? Like, you know, I don't know anything about it, like a clean room or no. Yeah, you just uh, basically you have to have all these different rooms that are going to have negative pressure, so air is always flowing out of them instead of inside of them. Um, and then also everything needs to be before and after someone goes in needs to be doused with UV radiation so that it can keep um, any contaminant DNA from being amplified. And then um, basically anyone that goes in there, it's probably the safest, one of the safest places probably on campus because everyone that goes in there has to be in a full Tyvek suit and can have no skin exposed because 
skin is a major source of actually DNA that gets shedded into the air. So that's, uh, we have to keep dust that's basically human skin to a minimum. So at least if someone's working in there now, it's, they don't have to worry about COVID-19 because it wouldn't be able to survive in there. <laughs> That's that's one good thing, uh, you know. And I uh, I have to admit, I've always uh, found it interesting. I mean, I understand you don't want to introduce yet more contaminants into a, a sample, but I've been on archaeological excavations, never one where we were trying to uh, recover ancient DNA. But it just seems this kind of it seems this you know bone that's been in the dirt for thousands of years and then it was excavated, nobody knew they were gonna find it, here it comes, and it's transported off, and then suddenly you get it in the lab and it's, you know, you can't have any skin exposed. It seems like <laughs> it's already been so contaminated, but, uh, mm -hmm. but you guys can sort it out anyway. Huh? Yeah, it's actually pretty, one of the decontamination things is pretty low tech. We just um, essentially soak it in bleach for three minutes, and then we dry it with UV radiation, and then if it's, let's say, like a tooth, we won't actually take DNA from the surface, we'll cut into the tooth, and then take the in it or bone powder or tooth powder from the inside. So to try to minimize uh, contamination. Anything that was put on the surface, which is obviously a lot, was put on that surface before it got to us. Right. Okay. So you're trying to get the sort of pieces that were uh, more or less insulated and from yeah, exactly. contamination. You know, at, at one point, I, maybe this was, you know, longer ago, but it, I thought that there was some argument about actually being able to identify the modern DNA and just screen it out that way. Um, and I always wondered whether that was uh, valid or whether that was a pretty dangerous thing, like resting on a lot of assumptions uh, that you're able to do that. Yeah, actually, actually, before we can publish anything, we have to show these quote unquote damage patterns at the end of the DNA molecules that are indicative that it's DNA damage occurred because it's ancient. Um, if it doesn't have these damage patterns, then it, it will be indicative that it's modern or modern contaminants. So actually we have to do that with every sample. It goes into the supplement of our articles because otherwise it's, um, you, you're not proving that you, what you published is actually ancient in nature. So we have to do that test with, with all of our samples. Is that always pretty clear cut? It's like night and day between ancient and modern. There's never like, oh, gee, this is really well preserved or, or this is a somewhat damaged piece of modern DNA. Or... Yeah, yeah, it usually is because it's, um, it's based on like you, you create these curves of damage at the end. So you should see a nice curve. If you don't, if you don't see a curve and it's flat, that's just, yeah, it's always, if it's flat, then you, your sample has been contaminated. You can't publish on that, those sequences. It's yet... It usually is from what I've seen night and day, even with well-preserved samples. Well, I suppose that's good. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, you've been talking about uh, your work and the things you got going and including a project you're trying to develop, but sort of spreading it more, more broadly, the, uh, obviously the, the, the discipline is, uh, you know, a growth industry is always new stuff coming out. And uh, I, I'm wondering what you see as sort of the most promising direction or the future um, for anthropological genetics? Uh, that's a good question. I think it's, um, I think one of the big problems for us right now is that all of the DNA that would, I'd say well over 90% of the DNA that's being produced is actually from Europe. So we have a tremendous amount of information from the demography and all that from Europe, but I really, South America is sort of empty. North America, there's only two individuals, well, maybe two or three individuals um, that are whole genomes, so it's a complete blank. Uh, Asia is pretty rare to have DNA at this point, Africa as well. So it's just, there's so much yet to be done and this is really just a, a really sort of a burgeoning field. I mean, it's really just started in 2010. So we just have so much, so much work to do. And then when you get to the species that we affected like dogs, I mean, that's a whole other thing that no one's really started on yet. So um, there's just, it's just the beginning. This is the tip of the iceberg, I think. Yeah, and so is that, uh, is it just about uh, where the researchers are located or about infrastructure or what is it that, that makes this so Eurocentric at this point? Right, I think it's definitely where the researchers are located. And of course, European labs are, um, there's way more ancient DNA labs in Europe than here. 
um, like probably in order of magnitude more. <laughs> so of course they're going to be interested in their own yeah. questions, right? Um, and also uh, working in other continents probably isn't, if you're not from that continent, poses problems. Um, certainly because you also want to engage the scholars from those areas instead of taking those samples and doing them with what, whatever you want uh, in some sort of black box. So I think that also puts a, a barrier and also slows things down because that's the way you're supposed to be doing things is that you're supposed to engage local scholars um, to really help understand the demography of these, especially when you're working with ancient peoples. Um, so I think that's that's been um, difficult because essentially since all the technology and the know-how right now is in Europe and in a few labs in probably China and in the United States. Well, this is something that you're taking on though, right? Um, you're trying to expand uh, these samples and uh, what, what kind of uh, uh, particular roadblocks have you uh, encountered trying to work, for instance, in, in South America? You mentioned uh, it was difficult having multiple countries involved and that kind of thing. Uh, right. I think it's uh, the, it usually takes about at least two years to um, establish a connection with either uh, scholars or museums uh, and then to see if there's any communities that would like to be engaged or uh, connected with this study. So that, that, I mean, it takes a long time just to get the samples and then maybe two or three years. In fact, there's samples that I'm still trying to get from Columbia and I started uh, my interaction with local scholars there um, three years ago. And so it's still not done. And obviously COVID is gonna slow things down, but, um, you just, it's gotta, it's gotta be done right. And I certainly wouldn't want someone just to ship off samples to me and not really care about what happens to them or how they get published. So I really want anyone that I work with to be heavily involved in what the question is it is that they want to see how it involves their own projects from archeology span or, or something similar or the museum or, and especially the local people. So it's, it gets, it's not so much a roadblock. It's just more that um, doing this properly takes a very long time to get the samples. Yeah, well, you know, a few years that I, I know that that sounds like a lot of time in a lot of disciplines uh, in archaeology, of course, <laughs> there are the long time frames, but uh, I do uh, see that, you know, there's this, uh, this has to be a real challenge in the DNA work because from the, from the outside, the perception is that there's like this race to the cover of nature, um, you know, it's bang, like, you know, we get the new sample that nobody else has and, and, and it's a huge finding and, uh, and the pace of, of publication and change seems to be very, very rapid um, from the outside anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I guess, uh, you know, it, it, it seems like it must be a particular challenge telling people that you need time to do the work properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that the speed is starting to slow down, but as I think there's been a lot of uh, pushback for labs that are were doing, put, you know, getting that rare sample, not working with communities, and then just um, doing whatever they wanted with it, right, getting that nature paper. And I think there's been pushback from archaeology, certain indigenous populations, especially from the Americas, to really stop that to make sure that these scientists are actually doing this in community engagement properly. So hopefully that's going to stop because you're right, people didn't care about these communities or anything, they just cared about getting the, the rarest sample and publishing that first without any regard to the people that are involved or the scholars that are involved. Well, yes, you're right. Hopefully that is changing. Now, uh, so uh, is there anything else that uh, you think that uh, would be interesting to share about the state of uh, ancient DNA work or uh, what's going on in your lab that I haven't thought to ask you about? Well, I think there's a, besides, besides humans, I find other species uh, really interesting that we could use even just museum samples to understand their evolution better. Like uh, I'm really interested in marine mammals, uh, especially so obviously the uh, whales and, and dolphins uh, that we can easily access the DNA from museum samples. Um, so, well, for, assuming that there's any DNA left in them, they're not completely fossilized. But I think um, there are there are really cool ways for ancient DNA to go that haven't even no one's even broached. Um, so I think this goes back to your previous question as to what might be um, the next cool thing for for ancient DNA. But I don't think humans are are the dead end for. I think there's lots of things to do with ancient DNA. Although then I don't know if that's anthropology right are dolphins anthropology <laughs> uh 
No. <laughs> Not really. Unless, we're, unless you're killing them or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, right. But then, right, so I guess I'll have to be a side project for my, <laughs> for my lab. Yeah, you can, you know, put some, you know, comparative perspective on human evolution or something like that. Uh, yeah, probably. Uh, but uh, other than um, the, the idea, I guess the idea is they have big bones and say so you might find some preserved DNA uh, in there. Why whales and dolphins? Uh, in particular? Yeah, I don't know if we know too much about their evolution. Um, I think we thought like the dolphin, there's only two genomes, so you can't do like selection scans or anything to see the areas of the genomes that, that have been shaped by adaptation and things like that. I think just in general, just genomics on those species fascinate me and I'd, I'd like to know more about their evolutionary histories. Yeah, well, there certainly seem to be some pretty extreme adaptations. Uh, right. <laughs> And then they might be hard to find because those would be very old adaptations. So there'd probably have to be new methods to detect that type of adaptation that, that deep in history. Yeah, well, I guess they get dinosaur DNA, right? Uh, well, no, not yet. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Our limit right now is only a million years. So we're still, hopefully that might be, uh, people think that that's the half-life of DNA, that after a million years, it's impossible to get DNA. It just completely degrades. Right. And with, with whales and dolphins, you're talking about, uh, what, 50 million or something like that? Or, I mean, yeah, so that would be some, <laughs> that, would, <laughs> yeah. that would be some hard, uh, definitely very new methods would have to be developed to detect that kind of stuff. Yeah, I don't know. Well, maybe, uh, maybe one of these, you know, uh, skeletons on the seafloor, I don't know, who knows? <laughs> it's possible. Yeah. Yeah, and hopefully I'll get my hands on it. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us, and you know I appreciate you spending uh, your time. And uh, thanks to the audience for uh, for joining us on uh, in the lab with the CNBC. All right. Thanks, Deets. All right. Thank you.